Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Joined today, he's an Emmy Award winner, producer, director, speaker, and author. It's Dr. Travis Fox. How are you doing today, Travis? I'm good, sir. Thank you very much. You know, every time I hear that intro, and you know, that was obviously the you know the bridge version, which thank you. I always go, <laughs> are they are they talking about me? I'm like, because I'm just getting started. I'm like, man, I did that's all pre-show. What are you talking about? So thank you for letting me be on the show. I really appreciate that. We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? How much? How long is the show? We got <laughs> as enough time as you need. Uh, the answer to the question is, okay, uh, it's a little more complex from the perspective. I was born in, in Phoenix, Arizona, 1970. So obviously born in the United States, but whisked off almost immediately off to Japan. And I spent the first four years of my life in Japan with my mother, who was a model and an actress. And at the time in the 70s, uh, you know, being five foot seven was considered tall. Nowadays, she's oh, wow. short, right? Uh, but she had, she had Auburn, uh, Auburn hair and green eyes, which was an interesting combination. So I got to grow up in Japan for the first four years, came back um, to the United States, did about uh, six months in Florida. And my father, uh, who was a fighter pilot, uh, put a golf club in my hand. And that was the beginning of my golf career. And I've been playing golf ever since. And then we were about a year, about a year after that, right in that little change mob, right about five, call it five, five and a half, I was whisked off to Germany. And so I spent the next three years in, in Europe. So I, I pretty much spent the better part of my imprint stage, zero to eight, outside the United States. Um, and I came back when we were about nine and a half. And uh, as uh, I always tell people, if you ever watch the original Top Gun movie uh, with Tom Cruise back in the 80s, uh, it didn't work out that way for my parents. It was like, like that. So when they came back from Europe, my mother obviously moved back to LA. Uh, they got a divorce and my childhood ended that at that time. Uh, and the reason that it ended was I was an only child, still am. Uh, at least I believe I am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, you know, my, my 50 years on the planet, that's what I've been told. So I'm going to go with it. But, uh, you know, my parents in, in the end, efforts to be progressive, uh, which really probably started my whole career as, you know, getting into psych and all the things that I've done over the years, uh, sat down and said, hey, look, we're, we're going to get a divorce. We're going to let you choose who you want to live with. So at nine years old, I had to move into what was I really interested in? And I really kind of moved into a fight or flight survival mode. And so obviously I did part time with my dad and part time with my mom. And then, uh, you know, because obviously I want to keep my golf career going and my dad was able to keep that more consistently than so at any rate, uh, long story longer, um, uh, I, you know, I chose my father for the, uh, from the stability side. And that's really when I started, you know, precursorily learning what your fight or flight mechanism really is from a reptilian brain. Because often we're told, especially going through school, that fight or flight is based on, you know, I've got a physical threat or mm -hmm. something, you know, bodily harm or my health is in danger. It's, that, that's true, but that's really not where we spend most of our time in fight or flight mechanism. It's usually stress induced. And that was my real first big introduction to, holy crap, I, you know, I am the king of my life, but I'm nine years old. I don't even know how to spell king right now. I got to figure out what that actually means. Um, but bottom line, I, I still, because I was a dualistic thing, I was doing what my father wanted, which was to play golf. And by the time I was about 13, I was a scratch golfer. Um, simultaneously, uh, when we had come back just before their divorce, I had got into my first modeling gig and I got into entertainment on my mom's side. So I, I, uh, uh, she taught me how to do runway modeling and I went and did my first audition um, and I won uh, the role, if you will. Uh, as a runway model for JC Penney's up and down the state of California. Wow. So I got into modeling and, and golf at the exact same time. So it was like still trying to please both of my parents, learning from both of them, but you know, really in that survival mechanism of I got to take care of me because this family unit's now destroyed. Um, and they weren't adversarial or anything, but it was, you know, two different worlds. Again, my father being a left brain fighter pilot, master's degree engineer, my mother the complete opposite, you know, college educated, but actress. So you have right brain, left brain. So when people ask, you know, how, you know, and I always mess with them when they're like, you know, how, well, you know, how are you? I'm like, well, I'm bi-hemispheric. How are you? And they look at me and like, what? And I'm like, I didn't say bisexual. I said bi-hemispheric. And I'm like, I can shift left brain or right brain because I had parents that were equally balanced in that and their thing. Long story long, uh, you know, everybody knew Travis Fox was going to be a PGA Tour professional golfer. It was in my high school yearbook. I was captain of the team. You know, I, I was a great athlete all the way through. My life was planned out more by my father than my mother. I still stayed in film and television throughout my teen, my teen years, but more, you know, in background role, under five roles, nothing heavyweight. Still was kind of playing with it because, you know, that wasn't cool back then. 
<laughs> not that golf was, please don't misinterpret. <laughs> but I, mean, I, made, I made golf as cool as I could. Um, but bottom line was, um, my life was kind of planned out. And if, you know, if you've ever had yourself or anyone listening to you know, the show, uh, you know, you have your version of what was going to happen and your parents' version. And my father was, you know, you're going to be a PGA Tour golfer, you're going to college on scholarship. This is what we're doing. You know, we invested 20 years in this. This is what we're doing. So while my friends were off on summer vacation, not me, I was off on golf tour. I was off playing golf events every other day, or every other week. I was, that's what I did. And so it was normal for me to think that way until my subconscious decided to show up in my life. And I was, uh, just as I just graduated high school, I graduated at 17, um, just a little bit past that, I became a first time father and that changed everything, it changed everything. And that's when my real path started to show up, which I've been on now for now 32 years. Uh, I had an emotional breakdown. I was ill-prepared for heartbreak of that magnitude um, because the, the, it just just like, what? I'm like, my world is shattered. My dream was, you know, now in jeopardy. There's no way to go to college and be a father and play golf and, 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 and long story long, um, that, that child, uh, by way of uh, the, the mother's doing, um, did a midnight run. And I actually didn't get to meet my child until 20 years later. Um, I had to track her down and find her. And, you know, I was, I was branded a great many things and I, I learned the audience is fickle, but what came of that was during that, cause I'd started, I was already at Arizona state and I was a basket case. I was a head case literally. So coach was like, look, you need to get, you know, your head out of your rear end. And I started looking around, went to the psych department and they want to do a, you know, more of a gestalt model and a Freudian model on me. And, you know, I'm like, well, I don't really give a shit about my mom and dad right now. I need to figure out why I can't hit a golf ball that I've been mastering for 20 years. All of a sudden now I don't know where the ball is going to go. And while all of a sudden do I look down at my shoes and I start crying like a bubbling idiot, what the hell's going on with me, man? I'm losing my crap here. My career, my life is going down the drain. Drama queen to the nines, of course. But I met my mentor and my master and doc took me under his wing and really said, Hey, let me introduce you to hypnotherapy. Let me introduce you to subconscious modalities. Let me introduce you to the emotional traumatic level so we can really see what's going on underneath the hood. No clue what the hell this guy's talking about. You know, because I, I was really introduced to psychology from Dr. Dennis Waitley from, you know, um, his entire world uh, uh, was really my start and then psychocybernetics became my, the two books that really kind of took me to that space when I was 13. And I thought, well, that was really cool. But I applied it to golf because everything was golf for me. But mm -hmm. Doc took it a different direction and said, let's apply it to you. And what came of that was two things. One, I didn't love golf. I liked it. And I happen to be good at it. I don't love it. But you got to love it to be Tiger Woods or a Phil Mickelson. Yep. You know, I'm, I've, I've grown up playing against those guys and they're phenomenal golfers, but they love it. I loved it because I thought I loved it because of, I was getting approval from my father. That's the only way my dad and I could relate. I looked like my mother. So you could see the, you know, the subconscious resentment was there. I'm sure he didn't mean to, but it happened. And it made our relationship very jagged. Um, and doc really brought that to the forefront for me, for me to look at it. And I said, you know, dad, I don't love golf. This is what I love doing. I love helping people really discover who they are, not who they think they are, who they've mm -hmm. been told to be, you know, from a programming sequence. And I changed my life and I've been on that track now for 31 years and it's taken me around the world three times. And yes, I did coach on the tour for 10 years. Um, uh, major winners. I had a great time. I was the first psychological infomercial in golf history. Uh, I was the first PBS show in history that was on golf. So I did make my mark in golf, but it never, ever to this day, and my father, uh, to kind of put a fun loop on this end story, uh, in 2020, right before uh, we debuted the, the film Beyond the Secret, which is the sequel to The Secret, which I co-produced and co-starred in with all the other guys that from the sequel, uh, from the, excuse me, The Secret, my father passed away, right, literally a week before we debuted that film. And to this day, my, my father was still pissed off. He was still pissed off that I never went back and played golf and he wanted me to go back and finish it. And I said, dad, there's nothing to finish. I'm done with it. You need to finish it. I, I, I love what I do. Um, and I love my team and I love, my, I love, I have three beautiful kids and, and I have a granddaughter and I have two other kids that by way of my relationship are in my life as my kids, because I don't like the word step. I don't think it's real. And I said, my career is taking me around the world. I still play golf to this day, dad. I still coach to this day. I coach high school teams. I work with college teams, but I do it because I love it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the little money I charge, that goes to our 501c3. So it doesn't even go to me. I said, so like, I gave back to golf, dad, for what it gave to me. But I, 
not interested. I, I love what I do. And it just never could translate to him. Yet, of course, to my mom, it was like, she's like, I get it. You're on stage. You've been on stage your whole life. And I have. And so that's really kind of what brought me to, to over here and brought me to the quest. Do you feel if you went with your mother that maybe your path might have taken a different path, possibly? Well, not just possibly, undoubtedly. Um, I would have spent, you know, obviously I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles, but I would have grown up exclusively in Los Angeles. And I did a lot of time in LA, but I would have been in that scene. I would have been in more film and television, probably would have never developed golf the way I have. And I don't know that that would have been to my benefit. Obviously I can't go back and change it, but, you know, speculatively, I would say, golf probably wouldn't have been a part of it but golf gave me a lot of discipline so did martial arts and i did them together concurrently and they gave me a lot of discipline they gave me a lot of drive they gave me a lot of things that i still to this day use and as a matter of fact they're a part of our company um but i also think that there were some there's some dangers and pitfalls that would have gone along with that because you know part of the things that i got into in my time in hollywood were you know i i got into spaces i probably shouldn't have been in you know i lost my virginity at 13 years old Wow. It wasn't, to someone, it wasn't to someone my age. It was someone much older. Um, I got molested multiple times, male and female. That put me in situations I was ill-prepared to handle and had to start shutting down parts of my personality. Drugs were not uncommon. I mean, I, 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 I had pot by the time I was 13. You know, back then it was oregano compared to the stuff that's out there nowadays. But back then it was still illegal and pot. And, um, but it taught me entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, I started my first company when I was 13 years old and I was doing 600 bucks a month on my own, doing my thing, wow. you know, and, but part of that was because my mother was either auditioning for the roles or was currently on sets. So I'm left to my own vices. Not that my mother was not attentive. My mother and I are still very close to this day, but again, she's, she's a single mom and she's an actress full time and you're either on set or auditions. I'm off running around doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it would have, it would have had a deeper detrimental effect. And because I'm a people person by trade. I love people. They, enter, they I just find them entertaining. They're just, they're, that's the only thing to me besides the beauty and the majesty of nature in and of itself. But nature doesn't talk back per se, like communicating you know, humans do. It talks in a different language. I think that uh, I would have probably found myself in some places I probably shouldn't have been because just based on the ones I was in, I probably wouldn't, I would have gone down a different road and it would have been a Hollywood, you know, tragedy. And, you know, if you get that, 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 uh, space like Nickelback talks about in their song, just another Hollywood horror. Mm -hmm. um, I probably would have been victim to that because, you know, I, I, I had done a couple of films with, you know, some of the actors, which I'll leave names out of that were young actors as well that had gotten into that scene. And that's, that's part of the scene, man. You, you gotta be seen, you gotta go to the parties and the parties always lead to something. It's either sex, drugs or rock and roll, one of the three or sometimes all three. Yep. I think it would have been detrimental long-term and I damn sure wouldn't have been Dr. Fox. And I damn sure wouldn't have done any of these things. And, would have been part of the film and, and television industry that I've been lucky to be a part of. And, and golf wouldn't have taken me around the world. Golf has taken me around the world multiple times. So is my speaking. So, yeah, I think so. Um, but I think it was, a, it was a smart thing that my parents did when um, they, when my, when my father finally moved back to California, he moved it to a place called Apple Valley, California. If you know where that is, anybody listening to the show, then, you know, back in 1982, it was literally nowhere. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was BFE defined, right? So I was out of the LA scene, which was a culture shock to me, but it, it was so out of, out of the, the mainstream of what we had been doing and what I was used to as a lifestyle that I literally spent all my time on the golf course, mm -hmm. either in school, you know, because then I always tell people, if, you, if people say, well, Travis, what were you like in high school? I'm like, if you want to know what I was like in high school, it's really simple. Go watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I was Ferris. I knew everybody. <laughs> I was in every club, although I wasn't really in every club. But if you look in the yearbook, I'm in every picture mysteriously. I'm in the French club. I didn't take French. I, that took three years of German. I lived yeah. in German, so it was easier for me. But you see the, you see me in the in the, the yearbook club. I wasn't in the yearbook club. I never I had nothing to do with it. Total BS. But I was just that people guy that and enjoyed watching people move and seeing the the, the humor in some of the rules because I found them quite entertaining. I still do to this day. Maybe that's my anti-authoritarian issue. <laughs> I just don't get it. I'm like, and I think the rules are necessary to a certain point, but let's be candid. If you're really clear about who you are, do you need them? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't think you do, but I think that's also the freedom of choice. And I'm, I've always been a big um, proponent in exercising choice. So, you know, 
the, I always love to speculate about things like that. And your probably your question's duly noted and, and fairly accurate. I probably would have gone down a different road, but uh, my parents were astute enough to put me in Victorville, California, or uh, Apple Valley in Victorville to finish my high school and golf career, which is probably the smartest thing they ever did. I didn't like it. I bitched and moaned about it the whole time, <laughs> but you know, uh, I wouldn't have my beautiful daughter if I hadn't gone that direction. And I also wouldn't have golf in my life. And I certainly wouldn't be on this podcast with you. I would be, and if I was, I'd be like, yeah, well, I was a knucklehead and I've been going and then whatever. You know? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that that's, it was probably the best path for me, but it wasn't a path that I would have consciously chosen. Correct. Uh, yeah. I think, I think we all kind of come from that point. Of, oh, I would never have thought about that. I'm like, yeah, but that's why there's something I call bigger than us. That's more powerful. You call it whatever you want. I call it the great architect, right? The great architect is a hell of a lot smarter than all we are. And maybe don't have to necessarily define it cognitively like we do, but I, I think it would have definitely taken me down a different road and probably one that would not, not be where I am now. So grateful for that. You mentioned the things that you got involved in at a young age and how maybe the way that your parents were, you kind of did things on your own and you had to like learn from each experience. As a father now, are you looking at your kids differently and kind of, do you want them to kind of learn on their own or are you trying to protect them so maybe they don't experience those certain things at a young age like you did? Great question. Thank you for asking that. That's the first time I've been asked that question in a hundred podcasts. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my, the answer is yes to both. Um, I do believe that, that in a certain frame, overparenting is is equally as harmful as underparent. Mm -hmm. It is a delicate balance because there's there, there really is no rule book. Though, although you know, in, in my later years and with my partner uh, Aaron Huey, who's one of our partners in the Quest, uh, we actually developed a whole parenting course called Beyond Risk and Back, and it was something we developed in him more particularly developed over 20 years working with at-risk youth at a residential center. How do we get these kids to come back from? sex trafficking, from sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, cutting, bulimia, you name it, they've been there and bring them back. And some of that, um, and my own interpretation, because part of being an entertainment family and being on the road, you know, I was on the road for six months at a time doing tours. So my two elder children um, spent half a year on the road. So the beautiful education of that is they got to see the real world. Yeah. Not not the theory of elementary school or middle school or even high school for that matter. They did see it, but they spent their time on the tour. This is how productions work. This is how you're dealing with, you know, two or three shows a day. You're dealing with crowds of 3000 people and how do they work? What's the dynamics? How do you engage all walks of life from corporate executives to, you know, John Q public, if you will, if I can make that analogy, how they learn how to engage with people. They learn how to get over their fear of people. And my goal was always to have them follow their gut because that was the only thing that saved my ass when I was out there, because I, I didn't really have mentorship, you know, bar, bar my sensei, um, uh, sensei Tony Cole, who was my sensei at the time during my, my high school career, who kind of gave me guidance and structure through karate, and that helped. Golf was always my discipline, but it's a discipline of one. You know, it's you and the ball, and the ball doesn't talk back, and it doesn't do a damn thing until you hit it. So it's really always your initiation. It's your, so that taught me drive uh, and self-determination in my own self-drive. But what I do with my kids is I would always teach them, and especially my older son, uh, I would teach them, let's pick a topic, you know, because you're, you know, sometimes you're on the road for six, eight hours and there's nothing to do with the bus. You're just, you've watched every movie known to man. Let's have a conversation. And I would do parts like, and if you're, you know, my son, Christopher, I would say, all right, pick a topic. He pick a topic. I say, pick a side and whatever side he picked, it didn't matter to me. And I would just constantly go back and forth in a debating, healthy debate to get him to think cognitively under pressure on the fly and still trust his own gut, regardless of what dad was saying. And he had a total autonomy to say what he wanted to say about that topic, whatever it was. And he wouldn't, he couldn't get in trouble for it. And there was no right or wrong, but it taught him to, to, to follow his gut because at the end of the day, that's really it. And that I believe on top of his special forces training, he's a four tour veteran special forces, um, came back with 10 fingers and 10 toes, great leader, you know, has done very well for himself, became a lawyer from Georgetown, you know, now wow. works in DC. He accomplished it, but he's one thing he's known for is he's steadfast. He's, he can hold his emotions in check and he can make decisions on the fly and he can lead his men and women into whatever the situation they needed to do to. And simultaneously, he could still be, um, uh, you know, get his orders from his superior officers at the time. And I think that helped him well. And, you know, with, with my younger son, who is autistic, 
Um, he, I had to learn a totally different communication style, which you know is where I always tell people that's where the death of Dr. Fox occurred was when I was when I was 34. That was when my my third child was born. I was born autistic because all of my communication skills, all of these you know, awards and everything that I've oh, there's great Dr. Fox and film and television, you can, you can be on down and all that. Great. Well, autistics speak a completely different language. They speak from feel, which is how we innately as humans do, but they stay there. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't use you know, my, my vernacular, I couldn't use my articulation and my, my word mastery to, to talk to him. I had to be present with him. And that was where the next evolution came from. So I, uh, with him, it's about just being present. It was a great lesson. It's changed my life forever. And something I tell, tell often. And he taught me without using words. He just was present with me. Where the other two, I always wanted them, them to learn how to be who they wanted to be. My job as a parent was to guide them of, hey, these are how some of the things work out in the world. Doesn't mean you have to agree to them, but just be aware of them um, and have communication with me. Uh, and for example, Christopher, my elder son, before he went to, to college uh, in his first, uh, his first freshman year, I got drunk with him. I sat down and said, oh. we're going to go shot. I said, we're going to go shot for shot, you and me. And he goes, why are we doing this, dad? I said, because I was an idiot at Arizona State and I didn't learn threshold. And I don't think a lot of young people learn threshold because parents are too busy doing whatever parents are doing to not sit down with your son or daughter and say, hey, look, I know you're gonna to go to college. I know you're gonna drink underage. You know, you're probably gonna have these sexual escapades. So let's look at what threshold means. And threshold's that point where you actually lose control and you drink too much and you end up throwing up and maybe get alcohol poisoning and possibly kill yourself or put, kill somebody else. So part of my lesson to him was, I'm gonna go shot for shot with you. And we're gonna go into the point where you feel like you're gonna throw up. And I want you to know that feeling. I want you to know when your body is telling you stop. So that when somebody else is giving you pressure, whether it's, you know, it's a fraternity or it's a sorority or it's an athletic thing, whatever the hell you're doing, you have the strength internally to go, nope, I know that if I go one more step, it's going to be a problem. And so he learned threshold. And I think that was one of the exa as an example of a lesson of learn how to uh, trust you in spite of what other people are going to give you. And it's held true for him and he, all the way through now. He's now 34. Um, and I will tell you, he's a far more, uh, uh, accomplished human being than I am. Uh, and I'm a super fan of him. Obviously he's my son, but as a human, I look at him like a, you're an amazing man. You know, you've done shit that very few people will ever do. You faced death in a whole new way and did it with honor and integrity. You brought your men home and your women home and you, you know, you, you did it well. And you're now doing it still to this day in a different frame now, you know, being, being a lawyer. Um, and the fraternities that you're in with a master's degree from SC and a you know, law degree from Georgetown and you busted your ass to get it. You know, it wasn't like he walked around with 190 IQ. I'm not saying he's stupid, but he earned it. Mm -hmm. and when you look at that, you know, the intestinal fortitude, I think, goes back to those days when we were on tour as a kid where I would, I would push him to the debate to the point where he would start to feel emotional, like he was going to lose control, like dad was pushing him. And I'd say, there's the threshold. So what do you do at that moment? And it, working with whether it's breathing, you know, whether it's breathing techniques, whether it was learning how to do self-hypnosis, whether it was looking where his trigger points were, he really became crystal clear and aware. And I think that's what really all we can do as parents is help our kids identify what this is. Because remember, they're new to the spacesuit, the body. They came from wherever you want to call that, whatever that is in your in your in your belief structure. You know, they came from here. So they're they're learning spatial awareness, learn body rapport, they're learning. What the hell does that mean when my body goes no more alcohol or, you know, like sushi, the one more bite of sushi and now you're too full. And if you, you stay right there, then you're right at that edge or, you know, that, that, that threshold. And I think most of us, unfortunately, myself included to a certain degree, if I hadn't met doc, I would probably have, I didn't have the mentorship that I needed from that frame. I think that as parents, we're too busy worrying whether our kids are going to find out that we're all fucked up, I'm like, but they already know. Right. So if we own it, it demystifies a lot of things. And I think the reason why, and I know I'm speaking for myself, why I want to experience so many things is because I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was mysterious to me because I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what, you know, like, shit, I'm, I'm 14 years old. And, you know, someone say, hey, come to this part of this pool party over next thing. There's drugs. And there's women that are half naked everywhere. I'm like, oh, shit, this is great. But I'm way in over my head. You know, looking back now as a 50 year old you know, doctor going, holy crap, I was way in over my head. But at 14, I, I thought I was cool mm -hmm. because. You think you're cool, right? And you're in the cool crowd, you're having a party, and it's great. But you're looking back at it, you're emotionally and, and somewhat psychologically ill prepared for the onslaught of things that come with it. And I think we all learn from the school of hard knocks, and you're going to learn from that anyways to a certain degree. But if you know 
you know, how to trust your gut, what your true compass north is. And as parents, if we teach our kids to trust that more, I think a lot, a lot of the mental health issues that we're seeing, obviously COVID has been a massive, a massive exacerbator of that challenge, but we'll see a lot less of it because, you know, I think a lot of our confusion comes from, I don't know who I am. I don't know what to trust. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my, what my passions really are. You know, college is supposed to help you define that rarely does. Yeah. I think it confuses the shit out of people. It doesn't help you all. I'm like, I just spent 12 years doing general ed. Why do I have to do another two more years of general ed of the same stupid shit that I didn't want to learn for the first 12 years? Yep. It makes no sense. A college is supposed to be about me, what I want to explore, not what you guys are telling me to. And I think kids get lost in that. And uh, they they do other things that are interesting. They go to parties. They start dating. They start becoming you know, sexually active in a, in a very prolific way. I didn't, I didn't have things like we have the dating apps nowadays. Oh, my God. If we had that when I was there, I was going to be a total slut. I probably have 40 kids. <laughs> Well, I, I probably have 40 kids. I'm like, that, that, I don't know if that's a good thing, at least, you know, for my generation. So I, I, you know, my goal with parenting was always just to go trust your gut, man. Cause at the end of the day, you know, it's you and you, this is your adventure. This is your life. Yes. I happen to be your father, but that doesn't mean I'm gospel. Not everything that comes out of my mouth is stone cold written in tablets. So let it be written. So let it be done. In fact, quite often, I'm making shit up too. I just don't want you to find out because I might lose my authority over you to say I'm dad and I know what the fuck I'm talking about, but I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm making crap up, right? And so I think if we really approach that with our kids, one, it deepens the bond of trust because authenticity knows authenticity. I think two, it demystifies that we have to know everything because bullshit. We as parents don't know. We're making crap up, man. There is, we are ill-prepared for the task. I don't care if you've had one kid or 29 kids. Each kid's its own journey their own entity their yep. own being and i think that you know trying to fit a square peg into a round hole is always a challenging concept and uh, i i went the, so for my upbringing the the things that i got into by demystifying some of them you know the feedback i've gotten from them now is yeah it helped a lot because out there in the real world you know most of the they would see kids drunk and they're like that's stupid because they knew that person would pass threshold ah got it so they saw the effects of it but they understood where the effects were coming from because they'd already experienced it themselves. And I think that demystified it also gave them the strength of solidity to hold their ground in a respectful way, but also an honorable way to themselves. And that's, that's really how I parented. I know for me, I gut feeling has been something that I always take to heart because I'm like, if I don't feel comfortable with it, I'm not going to proceed forward in it. And threshold was definitely, I could see it with friends going to college, being in a fraternity. I could see them going so crazy. And I know when I was in college and I joined, a lot of my family thought, oh, you're just going to become an alcoholic. But it was like, and I hadn't even been to, I hadn't even gone on campus yet. They're just already assuming these things. That's because everybody watched the movie Animal House and thinks every fraternity is yes. on that model. I'm like, no. It, it gives such a bad rep because I was trying to be the opposite of that. But when I turned 21, I'm like, okay, I can, I'm going to be like a little bit crazier, but I'm still going to be careful gut feeling threshold, but I think I would bl not blame, but thank the shows and movies I watched before I went to college to mm. see, okay, they're writing the story, but most of the times when they're writing these stories, it's kind of like an idea they got mostly like law and order SVU. They take things that happens in the real world, right. make it a little fictional based on, create, based on real life. Yeah. And, it's and literally that first movie. thing that they say at the beginning based on true events, but fictional um, outbreaks. And so I think that helped me when I went to college, but then I became kind of like that dad figure in a way. Like I wanted to help make sure people didn't go crossing yeah, that. You're boundary. the designated driver, right? You're the responsible. Which I was fine with that until I got 21. I'm like, okay, I can't be doing this. You got to make your own decisions because right. I can't, if I'm busy, I, I will help you get to safety, but I can't just drop everything to go. But when I was younger, I would be that person. Hey, call me. Let's go. Yeah. And I think a lot of that for me, you know, and I, I love that because I had friends like that too. And I, I became that as well because it demystified. I'd already done drugs. I'd already had sex multiple times. Obviously I was a father, you know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I had all those things. So a lot of those things, you know, that kind of that freshman 20 that you gain the 20 pounds. Yeah. So I didn't have that experience. And I think growing up, you know, as an only child and quasi alone, if I can use that quote, there, there wasn't the safety of, I have my family and I'm used to being around my family. It was me. 
So I think what you're describing, if I may be so presumptive, that's what kids are trying to learn, or young people, I should say, are trying to learn when they go to college is how the hell do I manage my time? How do I get to class on time? How do I wash my underwear? How do I do the, because, you know, when I went to high school, you had home ec. Nowadays, home ec, don't even think about it. It doesn't exist. Nope. You know, never had you know, it. Yeah, you never had it. Makes, I'm like, but isn't that what high school should be preparing us for? I mean, you know, I, I came out, but I was also into real estate as a kid. I went in as a, you know, as a real estate major, came out, came out a psychologist, go figure. But uh, I still did real estate always to the side because it fascinated me. And what I found, I found interesting nowadays, you know, kids come out of high school, they don't know how to buy a car. They don't know how to read a contract. They don't yep. know how to get an apartment lease. And I'm like, well, how the hell are they getting prepared for life? So what we're really saying is, hey, look, we're going to teach you all this useless information about crap you don't need just so we can get you into a conformative state of mind. And then after your college, theoretically, now you're supposed to be prepared for the world, but you don't have any experience. So how the hell are you prepared? You got this big piece of paper, but no one gives a shit because you don't have any experience. Well, how am I supposed to get experience if I don't? And it's this loop of constant frustration of, well, how do I get, how do I get an apartment? And that's how we all end up getting in debt and we do stupid shit in our 20s and we buy cars that we don't need and we get into houses that we shouldn't be in because we don't know how to read contracts. Why aren't we taught those basic things? Those are survival skills. Those are skills of life. But the only way you get to learn them is the school of hard knocks. And the school of hard knocks is exactly what it's described as. You get knocked around, you know, <laughs> beating your head against the wall, keep expecting it to become a bloody door, but it's not, it's a freaking wall. And the only way you learn that is when your head's finally bleeding, like this hurts. You're like, yeah, no shit, don't do that. Oh, well, no one told me. Exactly. So why not? So, you know, part of what we, you know, what we really endeavored at the quest and have been doing is let's teach the skills, but let's teach it in a fun way. Yeah. Because most education sucks. It's boring. It's boring. I mean, I'm, I, I know just respect to my, my teachers out there i loved your jobs they are the most underpaid people in the world and i think that's a travesty and our our society at least in the united states is completely bass backwards flipped upside down we honor athletes and sports stars who most of them are knuckleheads right great role models and yet these teachers are paid you know thirty thousand forty thousand a year this year that's poverty man that makes mm -hmm. no sense they should be getting a hundred thousand two hundred thousand three hundred thousand a year because they're gearing up our people and so our endeavor was what if you made learning fun again? Because the only teachers I ever remembered from my entire career was those who made it fun. Yep. The rest of the time, I, my Asperger's kicked in. I walked in. I looked at, the, looked at everything they said. I memorized it. I walked out, came back. I did the quiz and the test or whatever it was and walked away. I graduated high school at the 385. I never took a book home my entire high school career. My dad thought, the dad thought for sure I was going to flunk out of school. I said, Dad, I'm a straight-A student. We have you know, a couple of bees over here because I'm lazy, right? And I don't know what being a teacher assistant actually means. I don't know what, I don't know, as long as it gets me out of class, I can play golf. I don't give a crap. And I said, the rest of the stuff is regurgitation. That's not learning. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just repeating shit. And I said, I, and our schools obviously have gotten even worse. And now it's to the point where it's just, it's test taking for tax dollars. And that's all it is. And I'm like, that's, that's a travesty of human development. And so the, I see this generation, this new generation, which I'm fascinated by, because they got YouTube and they got TikTok. They got, they're out there, you know, they're freaking, oh, I've exited four companies and I'm 16 years old. I'm worth 42 million. What? Holy <laughs> shit. How did that happen? Oh, that's because they have the University of YouTube. What a concept. I get to learn what yep. I want. And so our entire philosophy is always the same thing. I do not, I do not like well-rounded people. Not that I dislike people, but I mean, I don't tend to hang out with them. And that's what education makes you is well-rounded. You know a little bit about everything, but you don't know jack shit. That doesn't make sense. But if you look at these generation, they know exactly what they want. They want to learn everything about NFTs. They want to learn everything about crypto. They want to learn everything about website development, funnels, and they're masters of it. And they're making great rewards for it because of their mastership. Whereas my generation and the generations between me and them, school of hard knocks, baby. Yep. I'm like, well, man, I got, I got two papers up here that says I'm supposed to be smart as a tack. Guess what? I'm dumb as a brick. I'm like, I look at these guys and I go, Shit, I was born in the wrong decade, man. I'm sure there's many that said that, but I go, you know, I'm, I'm fairly intelligent. I mean, my IQ is, according to the IQ test, I'm up there, but according to certain things in the world, I'm the dumb as an idiot. I'm like, this makes no sense. Why? Because my traditional education was based on tradition, not on learning. These kids go YouTube, they learn what they want, and they master it. And I'm fascinated by that. So part of what we said was, well, wait a minute. Why don't we make it a learning system, but why don't we make it a game and why don't we make it fun? Why don't we make business fun again? Because when it's fun, you'll do it. And we all know the adage, 
time flies when you're having fun. Yep. Ugh. So why isn't why isn't learning fun? Oh, that's why because you've got to go be disciplined and you've got to get up and get up. <laughs> We'll be lucky if there's, you know, elementary and, and, and high schools in the next five years, I wouldn't be surprised if they're obsolete. They're gone. Well, duh, COVID accelerated that from a home learning perspective. But let's be candid. What did the kids do while they're in COVID? YouTube. They went online and they learned. Yeah. They're like, well, why, why should they go back to college and, you know, get into debt for 100000 or 200000 or $300,000 for some Ivy League educational piece of paper? I've already made $2 million in crypto or NFTs or... Forex or whatever the heck, real estate, whatever they're doing, because they went and learned it. And I went, that's mastership. That's how we used to do it. Master to apprentice, master to apprentice. That model doesn't make sense. So on the whole thing that we designed was, hey, make it fun. Make it and make it for all ages. Make it for all uh, online, offline, and make it so a space where you're stepping into your mastership instantaneously. Well, where's your mastership live? It's in your subconscious and your emotional traumatic level. You know, that's where it lives. And that's why the whole self-help industry, I became, from a certain point of view, probably the black sheep of that industry, even though I've been in it for you know over three decades now. I came in and said, wait a minute, the self-help industry, which I was a part of, and I hold myself in contempt. I said, we help you do the same stupid shit over and over again. We don't actually help you transform. We just keep you in the loop of becoming a seminar junkie or a workshop junkie and the high ticket sales. I'm like, why? Every major company that's gone to billion dollar plus valuations have all done it with the exact same model. That includes Amazon, Netflix, name it, go down the line. It's small revenue on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. I said, the high ticket item doesn't work because we know 80% of the people, actually it's 92 to be specific, 92% of the people in the self-help industry never complete that which they purchase. Why? Because it feels like work 99% of the time and it only gives you one piece and then you got to go to the next step and the funnel and then, okay, great. So the whole design was, what if I gave it to you in the power of your hand, I give it to you in the phone, I put it to you in an app, 24 hours a day, and it's a game you play. There's leaderboards, there's cash prizes, there's things that you experience, but you're learning the way you're designed to learn as a human. And that's down at the emotional subconscious level. Now we're transforming from the inside out because the, the, the thing that I discovered in my career, I guess my claim to fame, if there is such a thing, is it's a sequencing issue. Our sequence is what's screwed up. We're told mind, body, spirit. That's the common cliche that's been in humanity now for the better part of three or four centuries. Mind, body, spirit. Here's the problem. Mind can't solve itself. Einstein said it best. That which created the problem can't solve it. Duh. Which is why when we start to do, I need my better mindset skills. Alex, I got to work on my mindset, my mindset. Well, I'm like, well, how is your mind working on itself to get a better mindset when your mind is the problem? Yeah. That is the definition of nuts, insanity. And yet 936 billion dollars a year is spent on this self-help industry. I'm not saying that all of it is bad. Please don't misinterpret all my fellow coaches, teachers, trainers, facilitators. What I am saying is stop the bullshit. Stop the high ticket item stuff because it doesn't help. It's the 1% helping the 1%. And now more than ever, now more than ever, and I'm, I'm pontificating, I'm on my soapbox, I understand, but I'm there family because I'm passionate about this, that people have the skills. Our, our entire sequence, 36 bucks. It's $2.99 maximum you can spend in the app and it's not in-app upsells it's just the maximum you can spend it's subscription 36 dollars you can't that, that's something you can't take a family for mcdonald's for 36 bucks cut the crap now but you can get 30 hours of adventure gameplay that will transform your business each other profile do it in a fantasy gameplay how to increase your sales how to create hiring and firing sequences how to get over the top seven fears for your public speaking fear of success fear of failure and do it in a way that you don't even realize you're learning because you're having fun doing it and the whole family can do it with you that became our quest and that became the legacy that you know for me personally being the the elder of the group, so to speak, although I act like I'm 16 now, <laughs> probably will do that for the rest of my life because why not have fun? Is make it gameplay, make it fun. So now we took price barrier out of the equation, put it in the palm of your hand, made learning fun again, and immediately changes your business model where you actually start making money. You're not scared of people. You can see it, you understand it, and now you move and you have the skill set exactly how to do it. And now the sequencing has changed. You don't go mind, body, spirit, right? body becomes one of the first things you deal with because we're in our body 24 hours a day. And most people don't have body before. They have no clue, right? And that, that's because we're not taught it. In fact, we're taught, let, let's go down a little bit. Of, there's your, here's your, uh, 
your uh, your podcast warning if you have sensitive ears, but we're going to go to a little bit of a topic here for a second. We are generally taught, you know, about body report. Don't touch yourself. You'll, you'll grow palm, you know, hair on the palm of your hands. You know, we're taught touching ourselves and exploring why does this muscle do what it does? You know, like when you're wearing, we're in competitive bodybuilding, which we are with our supplement line and our CEO is a competitive and winning bodybuilder herself and full-time CEO and mother of two. So it can be done, right? But we're not top body report. Why does, why do my traps do what they do? Why do, how does my bicep actually, why is it called a bicep? Well, two would buy, well, the, the long and the short head work differently. We're not taught that. We're taught any contact with ourselves is taboo. So we don't learn body rapport sometimes at all or until later. That's a travesty. So how do I know how to trust my gut? But back to that again. How do I know this is the right relationship for me to be in as opposed to I need to find my other half? Well, that means you're only half a person. That makes no sense. You're programming to say to yourself, well, Alex, I'm looking for my other half. If you know somebody, let me know. Well, okay, that means you have to go find half a woman that meets my half. And then you put expectation models on the relationship and the relationship fails because you didn't live up to my expectations. You're just another knucklehead. And I was another knucklehead. Da, da, da. I'm like, so we, we, all of these components become building blocks to build a legacy so that you're on passion, you're on purpose, you know your vision and you know the mission of your life and ultimately you leave the legacy, which is really the model. And so when you do that and you put it and wrap it in this big envelope where it's all fun and anybody can do it with you, well, now we start changing. And that's been the quest of what we've been doing for quite a while now. And now with the next version getting ready to come out here, literally as we speak, as this thing is being taped at this turn in time, this week, right? Here we are in 2022, the next version is coming out. And you can download on your Apple and Google store. I'm like, guys, go have fun with this. Let's do this together. And you have a community around the world that's doing it 24 hours a day because now you're doing business skills. But if I take you to, if I take you to go get your MBA, you're going to be like, it's I'm going to walk out the door. Yeah, it's theory. Well, you go to the professor, you go, how many businesses have you run? How many exits have you actually had? Most of them have never been in actual business or they're just consultants. And that's not disrespect to our tenured professors out there. Their knowledge is their knowledge. I get it. But knowledge is not power. Knowledge is potential power until it's actuated into results that you can generally rely upon or predictory behavior. Most of them haven't, sadly. And yet that's how we're, we're, we're teaching our business skills, and which is why I love this generation so much. I'm like, screw it. Let's put in the game. I'll show you how to build an entire empire and we can do it literally for 36 bucks. Do I have your attention? They're like, yeah. I'm like, download the app. We're done. That's it. That's my sales pitch. There's no upsell. There's no, but wait, there's more, Alex. You call now, I'll give you free shipping and I'll double your order, bro. And I'll put in this, you know, I'll put in these a couple extra products that you don't really give a shit about anyways, but I'll put that in so you feel better. How about we just give it to you one and done? Boom. And by the way, here's the ultimate body quest. By the way, here's the ultimate relationship quest. And they take all of the brand centric ideas and the philosophies that we, between the four partners with the, we have a collective 100, 110 years experience between the four of us in our respective fields, put together and said, we've done it multiple times in reality, thousands and millions and millions and millions of people. So we know the repetitive results. We've done it around the world. When we did our beta test, we tested in five countries around the world, all different languages, all different, uh, all different cultures to see that the human dynamics were constant. And they are. So now we go, okay, cool. Now let's put that in your body. Let's make body, make your health fun again. Now more than ever, your health needs to be fun. Let's be honest. The first 21 days when people start to work out and get into health suck mm -hmm. because your brain goes, I'm in pain. I got lactic acid buildup. I feel like crap. I'm exhausted. You know, uh, I, I got to change my diet. I'm like, yes, you do. But when you, when you start to get into that space where you're, you're eating a, a more clean perspective, you don't want to go eat shit food. You don't. And it's not that you're being contrarian or you're being rude to anybody else's choices. You're just saying, this doesn't feel good. We're back to the feel goody. I know my threshold. I know I can eat these chips, example, that are going to have X amount of protein. They don't have gluten. They don't have all these things. Or I can go eat these crap ones over here that have more chemicals than God. You choose. Just be, but be aware of your threshold of what's going on. So body rapport became a big thing. And then that translates into your relationship and the thing we call BPR. And when you, you know, if you don't have your BPR, you're probably going to need CPR. Your business will need CPR, your body will need CPR or your relationship, or in worst cases, all three. And so taking that from that approach has made it so much more fun. And the legacy that I, I'm audaciously going after for our company and our team as a big, big, like, Holy crap, this is, the, this is the macro of who we are, is to win a Nobel Peace Prize for putting education back into a learning space and doing that through the quest 
the, the quest series and there's nine divisions in the company in all different realms, but make it fun. Now, whether we get that or not, I don't know. I'm still on the adventure myself. Couldn't tell you, but that's, that's the big one. When we hit that, people are like, well, what, Travis, you've got all these awards. You've done this and you've got Emmys and all that. Why the hell do you want that? I'm like, because Nobel Peace Prize is the only thing that we globally agree on that has made an impact for humanity. That's why. I could give a crap about the statue in and of itself. It's a statue made like any other award that I've won or than you or the other team members have won. But it's a moniker that stamps it. You and your team and what you did on a global scale has impacted humanity. To me, that's the best legacy you can leave on top of what you can do with your family, passing that knowledge on to your kids, whatever that may be. So that, that's what we're really up to. And that's been the journey to get to here to the go right up to the show, for this matter of fact. <laughs> it's right here. It's still on it. And it makes it fun. And I think that a lot of people confuse fear and excitement. I know I was guilty of that when I was younger because to your body, if you don't have body rapport, you don't know how to distinguish them two, especially when you're in a survival flight or flight, going back to the beginning of this interview. Fear and excitement are to the body uh, anatomically are identical. Mm -hmm. Your brain interprets the slight difference based on the observation of the objectivity of what I see outside or what I feel inside. But if I don't know the difference between fear or excitement, I'm always going to interpret to survival mode. My reptilian brain is going to drop in and it's going to go into, I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. How am I going to pay the bills? You know, is this the right person for me? Should I invest in this company? You know, should I do this? Should I do that? Well, when you ask the should have, you have to invite yourself to understand that you are asking your subconscious to provide you with a set of rules for guidance. Hang out. Then you have to be really crystal clear. Where did those rules come from? Well, if you're like most humans, they came from your imprint stage, commonly called zero to eight years of age. That would be your parents. That would be the culture you grew up in. That would be the religious influence that you had. It would also be your educational indoctrination. That's what's running the show. Not what you think up here at the conscious level, but level two, which is subcon. That's what's running the show. And if you really don't transform yourself, which by the way, I'm a firm believer beyond the shadow of a doubt, and I've, I've stood in front of a million people so far in my career thus far and not even made a dent. But through that observation, we are transformative creatures. And we are one of the few creatures on this planet that can transform on demand. One of the other ones, obviously, is the chameleon. And mm -hmm. we marvel. Wow, Alex, look at that chameleon. It can change on demand. Hey, knucklehead, you're a chameleon. You can change you anytime you want. You can, be, you can change your body form. You can change your style. Look at what women go through just through pregnancy. That's the transformation of all time. You know, to go to that expansion and be able to contract, holy crap, that's amazing. But we look at it so like, oh, that's normal. I'm like, is it? Show me that. I don't see any guys walking around pregnant and, and that'd be a whole new level. But we are transformative creatures, but we get taught that transformation is bad. Bad. I'm like, but transformation is inevitable. How do I know that? One's called birth. The other one's called death. You know, like the great Alan Watts said, life doesn't define death. Death defines life. Death is eminent. Life is a choice. Mm -hmm. And so we get to transform. And I think a lot of us, especially as we get you know, into our uh, more mature years and ultimately into our senior years, change becomes scary because we still haven't learned to delineate between what fear and excitement is, you know, and a simple thing that, you know, our CEO has really coined and, and really kind of the, the backbone of a lot of her work um, for her career and also here at the Quest as CEO is fear is excitement without breathing. It's that simple. Because when you're scared, you st it takes your breath away. <clears throat> this thing's still recording the whole time. It doesn't stop just because you got into that fight or flight mode. And that's where we pick up a lot of unconscious habits. Excitement's the exact same thing. Except for when we're excited, we tend to be breathing. Oh my God, this is so much fun. <laughs> and we're just going at 100 miles an hour, but you are breathing. But when we get scared, even if it's just I'm having anxiety about how am I going to pay the mortgage next month? Or, you know, is, are my kids safe going to school? Is my relationship falling apart? Whatever. We get into the, and we stop breathing. Well, family, there's only one option when you stop breathing. That's death. And when you slowly do that, you're building the bricks of your own prison every single time. But I think that defaults back to understanding how my body works. How does my brain work? How, do I, how can I learn to transform on command? Now that's when we move into this manifestation realm. We move into the law of attraction realm, which has been so over popular, popular, uh, popular um, used in population, excuse me, and stereotypical. Well, if I just think it, Alex, it's just going to show up and fall out of the sky. I'm like, really? So... Did that purple Lamborghini show up that you that you've been staring at in your in your wall over there? No. 
Okay, when's it gonna show up? Well, I don't know, but I'm gonna keep focusing on it. Okay, let me give you a hint. If you keep staring at that, that thing on your wall there and say, well, this is what I want. This is the only way it's gonna look and it's gotta look that way. What you're really telling with your feeble little mind, mine included, you're telling the great architect, this is the only way I'm gonna be happy. You gotta give it to me that exact way. The moment you do that, you narrow every opportunity for any of the magic in your life to continue. It's over, done. You did that. Universe didn't do that, you did it. And we do that because we're told that's what we're supposed to do. And I'm like, time out. That's the mind thing. Your mind is saying, this is what it's got to look like. What the hell is your mind now? Mind doesn't know jack squat except for what it's learned, mm -hmm. right? We're back to that again. But a feeling, what if you look at that experience and say, hey, I want that car or that vacation or that home or whatever because of how I feel. So when you're staring at it, you're bringing up the feeling. Most people don't. They fantasize and they mentally masturbate. It's going to be great, Alex. We got that purple Lambo, bro. We're going to go down to Vegas Strip. We're going to get all the hot girls with our car, bro. Okay, great. How's that Volkswagen bug working out for you? Right? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's the feeling you're really after. It's not the materialistic event in and of itself, right? I, I've had all the great cars as well. And guess what? I drive a truck. I drive a Ford 2018 Raptor. I've had, I've had Bentley Supersports, Rolls Royces, Mercedes Benz, Rolls Royce. I've had all the top cars. Guess what I found out? People treat you different. Yes. And it pissed me off. I'm like, I'm still the same knucklehead I was when I got my first car, a 1984 Toyota Tercel hatchback with a ding on the back with the gray primer still there, stick. And I thought I was the coolest cat on the planet. Guess what? I learned that people treat you different because like, oh, well, then, you know, then also now I'm Dr. Fox when I show up in those cars. Oh, right, Dr. Fox, how are you, sir? I'm like, why am I not a sir when I show up in a truck? You have, so what you're telling me is the value of my external items is what defines me as a person. I think that's fundamentally fucked up. Be blunt. It's stupid. And I'm guilty of it. And that's why I've changed my life. I'm not saying don't drive nice cars. I love nice cars as well. I'm a car whore. But I'm also uh, going, wait a minute. I learn more about people when I show up in my truck than when I show up in my, in my sports cars. Because my sports cars, I'm getting a false bravado. Oh, I mean, you must be somebody important. I'm like, am I any more important than you? I breathe the exact same air you do. I do the exact same things you do. I trip and fall. I burp, fart, do the same things you do. Don't be fooled. Am I any more important? Jeff Bezos is no important more to me than you and I are. Great company builder, beautiful, beautiful CEO and founder of a great global organization. He's still human. And yep. he's, death is still going to take his ass too, just like it's going to take all of us. And not Steve Jobs, perfect example, brilliant human being, gone, gone. So then if we really started looking at, well, what are we playing for? Are we playing for our legacy? Or are we playing for our ego? And the quest really helps you design that in a way that doesn't feel so harsh. You don't have to go down to like, well, doggone it, Alex, you know, my parents and I, you know, we'd have a good relationship. Do you really want to do group therapy or do you want to go enjoy your life, right? Let me take it from someone who's been in that space. I'm not saying group therapy doesn't have its place. Don't get me wrong. I love my fellow therapists, but they're designed for a short-term intervention, not 50 years. And I have a therapist on call for six, 10, 12 years. That's codependency, people. That's not therapy, in my opinion, right? So what if we did it in a different way? And I think that's really what the world's really transforming itself, if I can use that word again, into this space. You know, how we arrived there is a little interesting, but I think it took something cataclysmic, per se, to get us all to stop for a moment. And this younger generation, you know, if you look at them, they, they're taking the bull by the horns. They're like, well, screw it. You know, if I don't have to go to school, then I'm going to go to the school of what I want to learn because I don't really give a crap about this or that or this. It doesn't make sense. And I think that's where we're seeing some of these massive advances where, you know, the generation that's too older than me, you know, like our, our current president of the United States, that generation can't figure it out. They're like, wow, they haven't earned it. I'm like, who said you had to earn it? Earn what? What they did, they just learned very specifically like a laser. This is what I want to master. And I think there's a brilliance in that. And that's what the quest really does. It says, Alex, you know, that's really great. Yeah, you want to start a podcast. Well, okay, great. What about what's the message of the boss cat? What's the audience you want to reach? Where are you focused on? Because the days where you don't feel motivated, that's when that stuff's going to come in handy. Because when you're motivated and you're high as a kite, you're having a blast and everything's great. Yeah, everyone's in your boat, row, row your boat. You're just rolling down the stream. It's the days you're like, I don't want to go to the gym today. I don't want to get up and make another podcast. I got five podcasts and my brain is jello, right? But that's when you go, time out. 
I get to do this. And this is why I love doing it. And you can fall back on it because it's a mastership. It's not something you do or it's a job. You know, it's something you chose to do. But remember, and this is the damnable thing of the whole thing, Alex. And thank you for letting me be on this rant for a bit and all of you listening as well. But really put this in a fine perspective and I'll stop here is we were all taught you could be anything you wanted to be. If you could dream it, you could achieve it. Mm -hmm. The moment you graduated high school, the exact opposite was told to you. You need to grow up. You need to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You need to start becoming an adult. Here's the problem. You just spent the last 17 or 18 years of your life mastering imagination, imagining creativity, imagining play, imagining being present, having fun. What a concept. And then at graduation, all of a sudden now, all that's got to go out the damn door. Here's the problem. We have no idea how to be an adult. We don't know how to buy a car. No, half the time you can't drink, but you can vote. That's intelligent. Okay, so let me get this straight. I can vote at 18, but I can't drink until I'm 21. Should it be the other <laughs> yeah. way around? You, know, you, you want to drink a little bit, figure out how to be a knucklehead before you start voting at 21. That makes a little more sense to me. I'm not saying you know it's going to change, but if you look at it from the sequencing issue, so we're all taught, you know these things. The problem is they all stop. And then we have to go without a blueprint, without a map on this crazy adventure called life and be responsible, be an adult. But we have no idea how to be any of that. We have no frame of reference, none. So we're now back, even with college, which is why we tend to see a lot of those things, we get stuck in the school of hard knocks and we end up dropping out, getting pregnant, doing all kinds of stuff, taking the 20 year program to get a degree that you never use anyways, you don't care about because you weren't, you're already bored. And when you're bored, you wander off. And when you wander off, you start inventing shit. And so it makes no sense. So the quest is endeavor and has, and will continue to be its endeavor in all the nine realms of humanity because you know, we're a human puzzle company. We help you find the missing pieces of your life, but they're not external. They're internal. It's unlocking that dungeon, that potential, that real hero in you and bringing him or her out because you've been conditioned to let it come out. And then all of a sudden it was conditioned that you being you was the worst thing you could ever do. You can't do that anymore, Alex. That's what kids do. I'm 17. I don't know shit from Shinola. What do you mean that's what kids do? What are you talking? I'm still a kid. I mean, de facto, halfway through your college career, you're still a teenager. I mean, that's just weird, yeah. right? But you're at college now, but you're still a teenager, kid. Hate to break it to you. Right? I, got, I got shoes older than you. Nothing personal. And it's, you know, calm down. And when you look at that from perspective, we, we keep asking, uh, you know, humanity to evolve. But at the same time, we're programming, programming it to dissolve at the same time. And we wonder why we keep doing repeated patterns. And if you look throughout history, even now in a current time, you know, every great uh, culture or empire has fallen based on the exact same model. Control, separate the classes, the quasi-feudal system, the elite, the non-elite, the haves, the have-nots, governmental power, constriction, and boom, revolution. Power has always been to the people and always will be. Right? when the people wake up. But how can we wake up if we're constantly hypnotizing ourselves? Something that you mentioned that really hit home for me was finding those passions and enjoying it. Um, you did mention like if I was getting up and I, oh, I have all these podcasts, but I always say that this podcast was the best thing that happened to me mm -hmm. just because it brought out and it showed people other skills that probably they didn't see I had. I'm in a marketing field, event field, and operations training. So that's my day-to-day -day job, and I do that. When the pandemic hit, I was like, I need to find something or find something that I can learn how to do. And it goes back to my generation where YouTube, internet, things like that, looking at influencers and things, those kind of people, that's how we get so motivated and do all that. And that's how I learned how to do this. And it brought me to meet so many great people like yourself and I wouldn't change it. And if I didn't have it, I don't know what it would be like. I, it's just so hard to tell, but passion, I think is a huge thing. And I always been telling when I was leaving college, I was always telling my friends, you got to find something else that you can fall back on if you need to, or something that you enjoy your next four years in college, because you don't want to just be going to school, going to class, coming back to your dorm doing your homework, go to sleep, repeat and the cycle, find something to enjoy. I found five different things that I enjoyed. When I took it out of college, I'm still doing those things. 
because I enjoy it so much. I think it's an interesting thing. And I, I applaud you for saying that. And can I, can, I, can I play Dr. Fox for 30 seconds? Sure. Because you brought up something that I think is the most uh, dangerous, well, a couple of words in the English language. That's the word find. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, and you didn't do anything wrong. Please don't disturb it. But it's something that we don't, we innocuously just kind of look over like, ah, oh, like you got to go find your passion. Do I have a roadmap? Is someone going to find it? Where is there a theme park? And yeah. what I find, puns intended, is that most people don't know where to look. They're waiting for their passion to slap them in the face. And then they go, oh, well, that's what I'm passionate about. I'm like, no, no, no. Passion is the exploration of you. It's not about finding your passion. It's going, you know what? I've always been curious and curiosity is the breeder of passion so manifest your curiosity because curiosity you can be curious about everything because there's so many things on planet earth that you don't know diddly squat about myself included but you're curious curiosity is how we started things that is the adventure of us as a exploratory of species which is how the united states came to i mean think about it you know everyone to explore but we get we are told that curiosity you know curiosity killed the cat no, it didn't. Being <laughs> stupid killed the cat. That's what killed the cat, right? But curiosity didn't kill the cat. That's the dumbest misnomer in history of life because curiosity is what got us to the moon. Curiosity is what created the internet. Curiosity was created the electric car. Curiosity is what created all these things because we were curious, what if? Mm -hmm. And why not? So a lot of people say, we got to find your why. You got to find your why, bro. And I'm like, listen, you alpha male knucklehead. You don't need to find your why. You need to find your why not. Why not is... I'm curious. Well, why not go to, let me go do Alex's podcast. I don't know what I don't know. Let me find out what Alex is all about. I'm curious about it. I'm not examining you. I'm not deposing you. I'm not judging you. I'm going, Alex, tell me about your journey. Tell me about the things you've learned because I'm curious. And out of that curiosity, passion will always rear its head. It always does. And so now instead of having to go find something, which would be theoretically would be the adventure, you know, the the, uh, the, the great Easter egg hunt of our lives. The problem with finding something is we don't know what we're looking for. Yeah. We're waiting for it to slap us on the head. The problem is time is ticking and is the enemy of all humans, right? And so instead of finding your passion, find your why not inside. Why not? Well, I might get hurt. Yeah. Well, I might get my heart broken. Yeah. Um, I might lose all my money. Yep. And why not? Well, you know, I need to have my safety. Show me where you've been safe in today's world. It's an illusion, right? It's an illusion that you create. So if you can create the illusion of safety, manifester, you can create the illusion of why not. And instead of trying to find it, explore it. Explore. Because at the end of the day, and this helps kind of keep things in perspective. It's something that has really saved me through the ups and downs of, you know, I've had money, lost money, had money, lost money, had money again. And yes, having money is better than not. I agree. Been at the top of the mountain, but I've also learned when you're up there by yourself, it's boring and it sucks. Doesn't matter how many nice houses and cars you have, you're still by yourself. That was what I, I, I the endeavor was. We were never going to do it alone again. That sucked. I was like, that's boring. You know, I, I, when I climbed Kilimanjaro, it was me and my climbing partner. That's it. But I, I could tell you about the journey. It changed my life. An amazing story. However, unless you've actually done it, you're only going to have a certain amount of relatability to it because it's like describing sex to a virgin. That makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. It's just all fantasy play. So if we're going to do fantasy play, why not take the fantasy play of why not and curiosity? Curiosity is the most powerful tool you have in creating a business, creating your relationship, creating your body. Like Tom Twilliger, who's a part of our company, you know, Mr. America, uh, Mr. Olympia competitor, top shelf, amazing human being. But he always says the same thing. It's, and it's really, really crystal clear. Your body is a science experiment. Well, what if, you know, turmeric does this? How does your body react? What if, you know, cinnamon does that? And you look at it from a curiosity point of view, your passion is constant because as a human, you are innately ingrained at a CNA, a CNA, Jesus, at a cellular level, a DNA level, there's what I'm looking for. At a DNA level, your curiosity is there. That's how you learned how to crawl. That's how you learned how to walk. You were curious. What do my legs do when I do this? That's how I learned to ride a bike. That's how I learned to skateboard. That's how I learned to you know, kiss a fellow human being, whatever, boy or girl, whatever your sequencing was. You were curious, but our curiosity gets killed in the monotony, which is why you triggered me so beautifully. The monotony of get up, go to class, get me my homework, go back. 
that monotony kills curiosity, which kills your passion. And then we get thrust into a midlife crisis. We get thrust into, I hate my job. I get thrust into, I really want to start my own online business, but you know, I don't know how, because I got to pay the bills and I got all this other shit. I'm like, great. Those are all excuses of conformity. Conformity kills curiosity. Curiosity ignites your passion because your passion is a constant. You're never not passionate. The only way you're not passionate is when you're conforming. And I'm not saying, you know, don't adhere to the moralistic rules of your religion or your culture. What I'm saying is conforming to do that monotony you were referencing. The same thing. Commonly known in social media today as the grind. Now, I don't know about you, but I've ever ground something. And if I put my nose to the grindstone, all I have is my nose is ground right off of my face and it hurts. It doesn't make a damn bit of sense. Why not get up and be curious? Hey, what if we went to this event? You know, what if we went to this art class? But I know nothing about art. Right, but you might meet 400 people, maybe might be the next investor. I mean, to this day, I can tell you golf has made such a massive impact on my life and even my business. You know, all my businesses have golf involved in them somehow or another. You know, some of my investors are golfers. We do all of our business meetings on the golf, the golf course. <laughs> What a concept, right? What a great way to have a board meeting. There's a concept. You know, some of my, you know, my friends are fellow doctors. We get curious about, well, what if we created a product this way? What if our supplements did this? What if it, we took all the sugar out and we actually made it more organic and we actually worked with the body's natural chemistry so that they get more the natural testosterone and hormonal balance as an example? Or, hey, I'm really curious. What's it like to do a podcast? I'm talking to one. He was curious and he did it. Why? Because he was curious. And your why not gets you through the excuses of our wizard brain that gives us all the reasons why we can't do something. But if you go, well, why not? It'll give you all the reasons. And then you can look at them and laugh at the absurdity of BS we tell ourselves every single day. Well, you know, Alex, I couldn't do a podcast because, well, I'm not good at a microphone. Have you ever spoken on a microphone before? No. Then how the hell do you know you're not good at it? Because you're predetermining that you think it's supposed to look X, Y, or Z. Be curious. Well, what would I sound like on a microphone? What would my podcast be about? What did, be curious. And immediately you unlock these beautiful hidden treasures of the castle of who you are that you have stuck down in the dungeon under the guides of they're not important. They're not relevant. We shouldn't use them anymore because, you know, that's, that's, that's what they do. I don't know who they is. I've never met they in my entire 50 years. I've never met they. I don't know who the hell they are, but apparently they're around, but I've never met them. But if they're there, I'm like, okay, great. Love to meet them. Curious. But they're not there thus far. The only they's are the little gremlins in our head that keep yep. telling us why we can't do something as opposed to why not. So the simple solution that we found and we teach in the question in deeper detail is conformity kills curiosity. Curiosity ignites your passion. Your passion is constantly constant. It's passion is not something you're passionate about. You are passionate. Right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, for example, people say, well, I'm, you know, I'm passionate about sex. Really? <laughs> I look at them and I go, really? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, that's just my game. Uncle Barry, let's play. I'm like, so you're curious about sex. Okay, cool. Um, and especially if it's guys, I'm like, cool. You're curious about sex. How about that guy right there? You're curious about sex with him? No, 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 I'm not gay. Then you're not curious about sex. You're curious about sex, maybe with, you know, with the opposite sex. Be really crystal clear what you're saying to yourself only from that perspective. So when we say things like that, we're so hypnotized and we do it to ourselves. No one's hypnotizing anybody. I and mean, one of my doctors is in hypnotherapy. I know a little bit about the topic. I'm like, guys, we're hypnotizing ourselves. So if we can hypnotize ourselves into why we don't do things or why we do things, could we hypnotize ourselves into why not? It doesn't take much. It's literally minutes and minutes and it shifts because it's already there. But we have stuffed it down so long ago, going back to all the examples we've talked about here on Alex's show, we've stuffed it down so long ago that we, quote unquote, hypnotize ourselves to wait for it, forget. Mm -hmm. Like, you have the most powerful supercomputer in the known universe. It's called your brain. It doesn't forget jack squat. It doesn't. It does not do that. It just stores everything. In fact, it stores 99% of the stuff that you're not even consciously aware of, right? You're not aware of it because you're walking down the street. It's picking up all this kind of information objectively, but it's filtering it out because you're talking to your, you know, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and that's where you think your focus is, but you're seeing how far it is objective. Well, how far is that wall away from me? Do I need to move around that person? Are they going to bump into me? There's a bus over there. Don't step out. I'm going to get hit. That's all happening, but it's all being recorded. So we have this massive supercomputer. So forgetting is something that we hypnotize ourselves to believe. And because we are great creators, you believe it. And I'm like, okay. So if you can do it there, 
then the old lady was saying, what's good for the goose must be good for the gander. You can do it the other way. That boils down for back to it again. Are you curious? And are you willing to let yourself be curious enough to go explore it? And if you are, your passion's there automatically, it happens. The passion is the fuel, it happens all by itself. From there, a vision will appear. You'll start to see things because your creativity shows up automatically. And then you go, hmm, that's an adventure slash mission. You put every word you want. I like adventure personally. That's the adventure I want to go on. Because at the end of the day, aren't we all really just in the theme park of life? Yep. It's a big old theme park. So do you want to ride the roller coaster and scream your head off and be scared and excited all the same time? Or do you want to go on the spin around ride where you puke your guts out and the floor drops out? Do you want to sit around and play the games over there? Do you want to eat cotton candy? Do you want to just walk around and just get sun on your face and don't do jack shit? All are totally acceptable. But be aware of your own curiosity and go on the quest of adventure. Because once you go on the quest of adventure, two things occur. It all seems like fantasy. It all seems like it's a game. It all seems like it doesn't exist until your reality externally to your eyes changes. And you won't even realize it changed because you're so busy in it, having fun through immersion, through the adventure, your business changes, your life changes, your body changes. And all of a sudden you're like, damn, that went by fast. I'm like, because time flies when you're having fun. And so that's what the quest is all about. And I invite all people to really just take a moment, listen to Alex's show again. I know I'm, I'm fire hosing the crap out of all of you listening. <laughs> But I'm, that's me. I'm curious. And I love, I love just really diving into this with people. But more importantly, gives you time to go back and listen to Alex's show again. Listen to what we're talking about. Really contemplate for yourself. Where's your curiosity been stuffed? What closet did you stuff it in and forget about it? Right? Where did that go? When did you stop becoming curious about it and becoming conformative to, and this is really the mission of all of our lives. The mission is to rescue our heart from mediocrity because none of us is mediocre but we play mediocre on TV and daily life because of conformity. Yet we were never conforming when we were kids. That's why we got in trouble. That's why we went out and played. That's why we did. We got into stuff because we were curious. When you quell your curiosity, you kill your passion. When you kill your passion, the vision goes dark and you're going to wander around in a dark room, baiting your head against the wall, looking for a light switch that doesn't exist. That is the mission we're all on. If that's a mission that excites you, come on the quest. So what does the future look like for you? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years, personally and professionally? Yeah, I won't, I won't go through the whole thing with a professional again. Um, you know, obviously the ultimate goal is the, the Nobel Peace Prize. But in the interim, in the short term, you know, it's, it's realistically two things. We, I, I really want the app now that uh, it's, it's ready in its fullest, most prolific form uh, to go global. I, I really want... Uh, 10, 20 million people to get on this thing because that's what's going to make the change. That's the tsunami effect in of itself. And that's the business quest with the body quest and the relationship quest so that they can really start balancing. And balance doesn't mean boring, by the way. Balance means I'm experiencing through curiosity and my ignited passion, my business, my continued body transformation, my personal and my relationship or relationships. But that's both with yourself and with an external, whatever that may be. For me personally, that's, that's where I am professionally. But on my personal side, um, is to be on the adventure with my, my friends and my family, my significant other. Uh, I, I love our life. Well, all of us that are in the quest, we're all friends. We're all fellow masters. There's such a respect in our culture. And it was designed by that way. And it was one of my deepest uh, curiosities and fantasies was what if we designed a company where everybody was a master in their lane? They had their experience. They had it. Everybody knew it. There wasn't competition. There wasn't, well, no, that's my job, Alex. And you're, you know, you're going to threaten me in the corporate position. And I got to be, stop. Put that shit out, right? Company culture is a key to making a business thrive. It's the key to the failings of the, and the success of the Spartans of ancient Greece was they all moved in the same direction and they knew that the person to the left or right was covering their back and covering their side so that they could stay focused on the target and have that adventure. So for me personally is I want to um, build that on the professional level, but I want to go around the world again, but I want to go around the world with all of my friends and all the questers and say, hey, let's go on these adventures because we actually are starting uh, in Q4 this year we have the, the quest adventures and I'm excited as all get out about this because now we're taking our fantasy uh, entrepreneurial side, our, our business leader side, you know, from the, from the gaming tech and, and, and all of that world, the NFTs and all the things that go along with this and put it in, in our external reality, but we're going in real world adventures. And our first trip is to, we're going to Africa. We're going to go to Africa in November of this year and people can come with us and go on the adventure of a lifetime. And these are not, Hey, Alex, we're going to stay and eat every freaking 10 minutes at another tourist trap. We're in the shit. What I mean by that is we get, and I, when I did Africa in 2018, 
um, you know, I, I had a couple of distinct things. One, we were the first white Caucasian people to stay with the Hadza Bay tribe in, in Tanzania, Africa. Well, why is that important? Like, well, blah, blah. like, hey, people, listen up. These people are the oldest nomadic tribe in African history. They're 50,000 years dating back as a nomadic tribe. They are still nomadic to this day. So imagine being out in the middle of the Serengeti. There's no house. There's no running water. There's no, but gee, I'm going to run down my local, you know, coffee shop, whatever that may be. You sleep on the dirt. You have a bow and arrow that you make. You have, you have a flint to create fire and you march your ass out in the bush and it's you and the animals. That's it. That's how we started as a species and they still have it, but there's something very primal about that. And that primality, it brought me back to a, a real sense of being grateful, being gratitude, as opposed to writing it in my gratitude journal about stupid shit. I was grateful going, wow, it never really dawned on me what a, you know, what a pair of shoes is. Mm -hmm. between hat and not having a hat in the African sun, having to walk six miles to even have a shot, puns intended, at some sort of animal that can feed, you know, four tribesmen and myself and my traveling partner, he and I were in this adventure together going, where the hell are we? We're so out of our element. And yet it was something very grounding and primalic about it that, so that when you didn't go to the five-star hotel, you know, after that three or four days is done, you go, wow, a shower never felt so good. You become grateful in a whole new way. So when you come back and you can't go to Starbucks or whatever your local coffee thing is, and it takes 20 minutes to get your coffee and you turn into an instant asshole because you don't have your coffee, you think back and go, I didn't even have coffee for four days. I ate monkey, wild monkey. It didn't go through homogenization or pasteurization. It didn't go through all the, you know, our, it was wild monkey. You either eat or you don't. What do you want to do? And it really changed my life. And, you know, going to Kilimanjaro and learning from the, uh, from the Maasai, the, the famous Maasai tribe, being able to be with them and see how they do things and see how these women walk five miles a day to get five gallons of water for their family. You look at that and they're grateful for it. They're, they're happy. I mean, I'm sure they would want it to be a little less, but let's cut the crap. You know, I look at that. And I'm like, guys, when you go to your faucet and you just turn out water, you don't think about that. Not everybody has that. Calm down, relax a little bit and really move into a state of being grateful. Those adventures that, we, that we're that we going on. So our, our bucket list adventures are literally bucket lists. You know, imagine going to a hot air balloon over the Serengeti at four in the morning and watching in the loud of silence and watching how primal earth was before man got it, his, his or her hands on it per se. But look at the animals because the animals are being the animals. They are the greatest example of being. You don't see a lion trying to be a gazelle. You damn sure don't see a gazelle trying to be a hippopotamus. They know exactly who they are and they stay in that lane. And that's mastership. That's beautiful mastership. And I think human beings, we've gotten so prolific at not being masters because the word master is considered rude. I'm like, why? I mean, the great samurai were masters. They were taught master to an apprentice, master to apprentice, you know, the great ninja, ninjutsu, and then the great teacher, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, same concept, you know, look at the Gracies and what they've done with Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I say, guys, mastership is the key. And because once you become a master of whatever that is, right, even if you're just a master of curiosity, you can learn from the masters that fast because masters speak to masters without ego generally, without, uh, I know more than you do, it's I'm already a master in my thing, you're a master in your thing, let's learn from each other and you learn faster, which is what made our company culture so unique is each one of us is a master in our own field. We've spent our, we've dedicated our lives to mastering that one thing so that we're really good. Everything else, I'm a student, I'm curious. You know, I don't have a podcast. I did, you know, 11 years on regular radio, but it doesn't, I wouldn't tell you I'm a podcast master, but I know a few, I know who to call and sit and go, Alex, I wanna shadow you for three weeks. I wanna learn how you do this. Assuming that'd be great, I'm curious. And it becomes a different, it comes a different ideology. And I think you know, when we do those trips, to be able to be out there and live and experience life, I think, isn't that what we all really want? I mean, isn't that we all got into business in the first place so that we could go travel and enjoy before we leave the planet and leave yep. something behind? That's it. I mean, that's the base primality of it. My life left a legacy for my children or for my friends and whatever that was, whatever your legacy is, but also to be able to travel and see the world. There's so many beautiful things in the world and some people never leave their hometown. I personally don't understand that. I'm not judging it, but I go, guys, be curious. I mean, I've traveled the world three times and I have yet to see half that I want to see. And I've seen amazing things, met amazing people around the world and have been in places that if I hadn't had golf or hadn't had my, my, my film and television career and I hadn't had you know, my, my background in, in psych and architecting and how I do that with humans and cultures, who knows, I, I could be that same thing. So it moves you into gratitude. And from, uh, I think from that perspective, uh, 
for me personally, I'm going to spend the next 50 years of my life promising never be the same man I was the first 50 years of my life. I want to leave the legacy behind of what the quest really is. And I want to have fun doing it with people who want to go have fun. Because here's the best thing. People always say, you know, the law of abundance, law of abundance. All right, I'm going to save you a lot of time, people. And let's make it simple. There's only one thing that's truly abundant on this planet, and that is the ability to have fun. Everybody has it. You can never outspend it. You can never run out of it. It can't be taken from you. The only thing you do is choose not to have fun. So you always are in the abundance of fun. And at the end of the day, isn't that why you got into business in the first place? And if you're not having fun, stop. Yep. Stop. (laughs) Because it's going to affect your being, your body, your relationship, your kids. Whether you like it or not, the kids are subconsciously modeling. They're learning. They observe and we model. That's how we learn, especially when we're young. So what if we just went on these adventures? And so for me personally is to take people on these adventures as much as possible. An amazing team that has that is just, I love them dearly. And every time I go, you'll learn. And imagine being going on a trip where it's uninclusive. Why don't you pay to show up? You don't do anything else. You want to you know, buy stuff from the local people or you want to, that's your choice. But you don't have to do anything else. Everything's taken care of. Enjoy, be present. But it isn't about stuffing your face full of food and alcohol and doing that on other trips. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's about being on a bucket list of things that you would have never thought you would do. Like being able to sit with the mighty Maasai and be able to sleep in one of their huts, knowing that you're surrounded by a thicket of of brush. And that is the only defense you have between any predator that will eat you and kill you. Because out there, we are not top shelf. We think we are, but we're not. Lions will kill you, very simply. Water buffalo kill more people than lions. Hippopotamuses are ruthless, territorial as hell, and very violent creatures, even though we all taught the game Hungry, Hungry Hippos. (laughs) It's not who hippos are. You don't hang out with hippos. They will bite you in half. So when you look at it from that perspective, it makes the adventure. Well, isn't life an adventure anyways? And that's where we find people reignite their curiosity. They reignite because passion's always there. So for me personally, it's to spend as much time as I can on the quest, with the quest, with the people out among. And I can't wait to go back on tour with it and start doing the things that we're going to do with people that are beyond just the app and the game and, and the, the trainings and all the things that go with it. But I want to see people change their lives. I'm a drug addict for that. I am an absolute 100%. Hook me up to the IV. I love watching people transform their lives. It is the most powerful movie I've ever, ever, ever watched. When you have that skill, then you don't, then you drop your fear. I'm not saying you won't ever feel fear again, but you'll learn how to breathe through it and get excited about it. And you can use that fear to go transform yourself. And guess what happens when you transform you? You transform people around you by proxy. And you're on the adventure of a lifetime. Wouldn't you want to be on the adventure before the theme park closes? And when it closes, it doesn't reopen. That's it. You know, you may come back again if you believe in reincarnation. And whether you do or don't, that's up to you. But if you're assuming that you believe in it, you ain't coming back as Alex and I ain't coming back as Travis. You may come back as an asshole or a donkey or whatever, an ant, you may come back as, you know, something totally different. And that's assuming that you have a conscious awareness of even that. So the old concept of, you know, uh, it's better to burn out than fade away. If I can quote Def Leppard's famous song, it's better to burn out because saving up for a rainy day is just another self-hypnotic illusion that kills your curiosity, makes you conform, put yourself back to sleep. That's my goal. Final question I'll ask you for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? First of all, do the quest. <laughs> that's what I <laughs> And I'm not trying to be a shameless promoter, although I probably am. It's because it's designed in there. But when you think about it, there's two things. I hate goals. I'm very candid for people. Goals don't make sense to me. And here's why. Chem, uh, psychologically, your brain, when you achieve a goal, turns off. It loses its focus. It loses True. its curiosity. So you get the goal of a million dollars. You know what? You, then your brain shuts off. And guess what happens? You either start losing that money or you go right into the next question. Well, how do I make more? Well, then you have to set another goal. Well, what happens if you don't get that goal? Are you a failure? Do you suck? Now, it doesn't mean you don't have things you strive for. But what if you put it in an outcome? An outcome is a feeling that drives you through the entire thing. Like passion is an example. is an outcome. My outcome is to stay in curiosity, passion all the time, because then I don't know what I don't know. And we don't know what we don't know. But how do you overcome them? And I think that's also a very, very misleading word. And and again, the English language is trite. It is a a very poor communicated language, sadly. But how do you overcome? Overcome what? Overcome in and of itself by the word it says is you have to go over something and come out on the other side. 
Okay. Unless you're in a physical prison, i.e. you're in a supermax you know, cell, you're actually locked up physically, what is there to overcome that you are the one that created it? I have not went, well, you know, I don't have enough money, you know, I'm not tall enough, I'm not this or that. I'm like, that has nothing to do with overcoming. Those are all ideology of a judgmental mind that is telling you that you are going to be X, Y, and Z as opposed to being curious. Because if those things were really important, that means every person who has ever had those things that you deem as negatives would never be who they are. And there's thousands of examples of human beings who are like, okay, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Nothing. So overcoming two, and the second part of your question is, what if you came from a reality check that fear is excitement without breathing, and that most of our fears are self-hypnotic, wonderful little mind adventures we play with ourselves? We mentally masturbate, puns intended, exactly as I said it. We are jerking ourselves off mentally into these future cast ideas of what if and what might be that, or Alex, or what will they think if I do this? And if I don't wear that, will I be in the cool kids click and all this other crap? 99% never happens. And we know that cognitively, yet we still do it. That is mental masturbation defined, period, end of discussion. So you're distracting yourself. The way we overcome it, using that language, if I may, is we dive into it. We don't run from it. Fight or flight mechanism is designed exactly to do that thing. It is a survival mechanism, but survival is not what you're actually in. I mean, let's be honest. Most of us don't know the ass end of survival in the first place. We think paying bills is survival. No, let me throw your butt out in the middle of Serengeti with a knife and sleep out there by yourself. That's survival. Let's see if you can make it one whole night without it getting clipped or getting bit by a snake or eaten by a, a, a freaking leopard or a hippopotamus or what the hell ever, because out there, that's survival. But we're, we've conditioned ourselves to believe that that's something different. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not guilty of it too. When I was younger, oh my God, I was in survival mode all the time. You know, the con entertainment conditions you to be in survival mode. The next gig, the next gig, the next gig, the next gig, the next audience, the next audience. And you're only defined as your, you know, you're only as good as your last show, the famous saying. So overcoming it is about diving into it. And I guarantee, and I load that word, I guarantee, because I can't find a better one in the English language, it stems from an emotional trauma that we are still replaying inside that is now spun up, created a belief structure in our subconscious and told our conscious mind, hey, be on alert, be scared, be on the lookout, be the world's gonna attack you. It's a dog eat dog world. They're gonna take yours and da 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 and all these things. 99% of them never actually happen externally. But over here, they've happened a billion times. And we all know that visualization, and guided imagery and those things work for athletes. They've done it a thousand, thousand, thousand times. It works the same in the reverse. If you've done it a thousand, 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 thousand times of all these what ifs, you're going to look at the world that way. You're going to subconsciously project that even though you may consciously and overtly say something different, your unconscious is still talking and unconscious mm -hmm. is talking to unconscious is our emotional trauma. And so it's diving into the dungeon of the castle of who you are in order to become the king and queen and to ascend to be the king and queen of our lives. You know, we do have to dive in the dungeon. We got to go look at our dragons. We got to look at those things we stuff down. We're a geek, we're a nerd, we're a dork, we're an idiot, we're this, we're that, we're gay, we're straight, we're transgender, we're this, I'm he, I'm her, I'm them, I'm we, I'm the whatever. Whatever the freaking label is, there's an emotional trauma that drives our fear 99% of the time. Some may be actualized, some may not, maybe just be potentialized. Either way, they, they either motivate us to move in a direction or they most often they paralyze us. So dive into it. And when I say dive into it, I don't mean you have to go in and do deep, long, you know, analysis, although you can, and that has its benefit. But if you just looked at the knowledge that, hey, Alex, I just want to be, you know, honest with myself and honest with you, right? Uh, I'm scared of blank. I'm scared of public speaking. I'm scared to do a podcast. I don't know what to talk about. Um, and be transparent because guess what? 99% of the time, the other person is feeling the exact same thing. Otherwise, they wouldn't mm -hmm. be in front of you. Now we're back to the law of attraction again, if you guys want to go down that road. So diving into it. Uh, is a reverse model. It's not mind, body, spirit, right? Spirit can be, you know, your being, your architect, your feeling, however you want to couch it, just spirit in general, however you define spirit. It's down here first, right? It's the feeling, it's the trauma, it's my fear, it's the rejection, it's not good enough, my lack of potential, all those things that we, we shame ourselves into. Then it's moving to my body because my body will reflect it, right? How my body moves and more doesn't move is reflective of that emotional trauma. And then that changes our mind. Our mind changes from down here. It doesn't change from inside, outside in, rarely. 
right? But a true psychological structure, it'll change from the, the emotional, that hits the subconscious, the subconscious rewires itself automatically, it's a big computer, and then tells the conscious to change what it sees in the outside world and how it is objectifying the world. It happens automatically. But if I try to tell my objective judgmental conscious mind, no, no, you need to change what you look at, it goes, why? Because it has marching orders from here and here that it's protecting. It's called the guard. It's guarding the outdoor of your castle. Now it's just this little guard that's sitting in front of the drawbridge, you know, who goes there? Everybody but anybody who comes in and out of that drawbridge, it's constantly guarding and pushing back and, and doing that. Well, what if you had the guard change its orders? Well, the guard can only change its orders based on one of two things, either A, sergeant at arms, or the king and queen. King and queen are down here. Right? King and queen are up here, down here. Right? Your throat becomes that sergeant of arms where you can actually say, okay, this is, this is my experience, this is what I'm feeling. But I think most of us were conditioned that, and we hear this in, in social media pop psych, right? Well, Alex, you got to be vulnerable. You got to be vulnerable. You got to be transparent. Yep. The fuck does that mean? Somebody, <laughs> come on, cut the crap. Did you just read that in a book or did you repost it on somebody else's crap? Do you actually know what you're talking about? Vulnerability is actually a strength. But as men in particular, we're conditioned that vulnerability makes you weak. And I'm like, where? Show me how that makes, first of all, if I'm not being transparent, that means I'm not in touch with myself. And I'm giving you a version of what I think you want me to say or do or be. Well, then that means you are actually controlling me. Well, then how can I be the king and queen of my own life if I'm succumbing to someone else's kingdom? I'm not saying that you can't work cooperatively. I work cooperatively with kings and queens every single day, and I love doing it because they're kings and queens of their realm. That's awesome how you build an empire. But when we succumb and we say, well, you know, Alex, that's not politically correct. You really shouldn't say that. Politically correct to what fucking party? What are you talking about? What do you mean? You're not, you're, what you're conditioning yourself to say is, that which is true to you cannot be expressed because X, Y, or Z is going to misjudge and reject you, whatnot. Well, then what you're really teaching yourself is that you're not of value. You don't have an opinion. And I'm not talking about being aggressive or convincing or domineering, just, hey, this, this scares me, or I feel uncomfortable with this, or this doesn't feel all, all right for me or aligned with me, without being a reverse judgmental to say it doesn't work. Or express it, hey, that scares me. Or, hey, you know what? I'm so excited about that, but I really don't know. And I'm going to help me you know, look at this, whatever. And we're so afraid to look at that. Um, you know, and I, I, me personally, I'm the oddball. I, I don't get it because me, I'm always, I'm always like, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? Tell me the why not. Well, and then they're going to give me all the reasons. And I'm going to go, show me one of those reasons that's generally legitimate. And there are some, don't get me wrong, right? I get, I get it. I mean, our CEO was a sex traffic survivor for real, right? Has actually thrown into it was in it for a long period of time, over a year, right? Family, the whole deal, threatened everything. I mean, it was true, the movie Taken, if you want to go that direction, in the extreme. And she came out the other side, became a COO, 300 employees, did a great company, exited that company, exited another company, and then, you know, over a period of time, then became the CEO of our company. And I marvel every day when I'm like, oh, yeah, I lost my virginity at 13, but like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I'm like, really? This woman was a sex traffic by oppression, by force. I mean, what, when, you, when you hear the whole story, you go, holy shit, I got nothing to complain about. So when we really dive into our fears, it's really diving into, you know, it's most often not, we're afraid to be honest with ourselves. We're afraid to admit, and this is the best way to couch it. And I should really kind of crescendo on this mark. Isn't is the truth is told in the dark. That's why we call it the beautiful darkness. That's why we go to clubs at night. That's why we go to dates generally at night. That's why we generally have sex in the dark or at night in the bedroom. So the truth is in the dark because we can't be seen per se. We can only be felt. Okay, so if the truth is in the darkness, then doesn't it mean down the darkness of yourself, the shame, the guilt, the anger, the frustration, the resentment, you know, not good enough, living up to your potential, the oppression, the suppression, all the things that you hold down in there, that's where the truth lives, in the beautiful darkness, which will balance out your yin and your yang. You know, of the great Taoist, it will balance you out. They both are required for you to become a fully balanced king and queen. You have to have your warrior, your wizard, your bard, your jester all explored so that you can be the king and queen of your life and ascend to that space because king and queens have access to all their warriors. They know who their wizards and their councils are. They know their mess messengers, the bards, and they know their jesters, which are the ones that remind them that king and queens are always temporary, that life does have an end and your time on the throne will come to a conclusion. So live it always, right? When you get that balance, that's the balance of the curiosity. And then you can explore anything. And I think this really extends into relationships. We are so afraid.
to be truly expressive with our partner. But isn't that why you got into a relationship in the first place is so that you could be exclusive and go, hey, you know what? I really like it when you take a feather and you tickle my ear with it. I think that's really hot, right? The person goes, oh my God, it's so weird. And you're like, is it weird? Why is it weird? Have you ever experienced it? Are you curious? Well, I just, you know, I, I wouldn't do that. Why not? How the frick do you know whether you do it or not? Stick a feather near, find out. But isn't that the point of a relationship is that you can explore with each other and transform and grow? Because if you're going to be in a relationship for 30 or 40 years, you have to. Because it will happen automatically with your nature. So to overcome these things, it really is going back and looking at who we really are down here. And we're so afraid of our shadow. We are so afraid. I know. I hold myself in contempt. It took me 40 years. And I teach this. I've been teaching it my entire life. And it took me 40 years to finally come to the conclusion of my own shadows, my own truths, my own issues, my own fears and doubts. What if they find out? What if? Oh, my God. What if they find out? And, you know, I was molested. What if they find out? You know, my dad was not the most positive person I've ever met in my life. What if they find out? I, you know, I did drugs. What if they find out? You know, I... I'm a knucklehead. What if they find out, you know, I burp and I fart. Oh my God, they'll screw the entire image up. And oh my God, my career's the shit. I've done all that too. But that's what keeps us in the prison. That's what keeps us in the prison of monotony. It keeps us in the prison of, of conformity as opposed to just exploring it. But we're so afraid that people will find out. I'm like, but you already know. You're the one that put it in the dungeon. So you're, you're really lying to yourself. And then we wonder why we get things like disease. Because we're at war with ourselves. Duh. Looks good on the outside, but on the inside, we're a freaking mess. Isn't it time we take that mess and turn that beautiful misfit into you into the master that you already are and always have been? Turn mm -hmm. on that curiosity, ignite that passion, go on the quest of a lifetime and have fun doing it because death is coming for us all. And I'm not trying to make you know death light in any way, shape, or form. I'm trying to get it through your smack of whack at you in the head of wake up kids there is no guarantee and if nothing else if covid didn't bring that to your attention then shit man take a look in the mirror and real and realize death cannot be negotiated with you can't buy your way out of it you can't sex your way out of it you can't talk your way out of it death is non-negotiable so if that's true then as I, like the great alan watts said life doesn't define death death defines life then accept that death is imminent and Alan does a great thing. And I think it's the best one I've ever heard. So credit given where credit due. I think everyone, as he said so eloquently, should contemplate that one day you're going to go to sleep and you're never, ever, ever going to wake up ever, ever, ever again in this frame, in this body. You're never going to do it. Contemplate that for a minute. And then look at the things that you hold on to as fear, guilt, shame, doubt, worry, judgment. And I think that you will find you become quite curious of why you're holding on to this shit because death comes and all of it's gone anyways. And taking the secret to your deathbed, the only person you screwed was yourself. And you know it. And you knowingly and willingly do harm. Well, that's masochism. Any way you slice it, that is self-harm. I am harming myself on the concern of what Alex or the audience might think or judge me. It might hurt my business. I'm going to... Dude, there's 7.4 billion people on a planet. Your business is fine. Calm the F down, right? Relax. There's plenty, more than you can possibly fathom. Even Amazon can't get to them all, right? Alibaba can't get to them all. And they're doing great, right? Apple can't get to them all. Google can't get to them all. Facebook can't get to them all. And they're still going. So my point being, the overcome is to dive into the dungeon. But I think when you do this in an archetypal way, like we do in the quest, it takes some of the fear out of exploring yourself because now you can understand the categorizing of why am I a dictator at times or why do I become a barbarian or why do I become a vampire? What does it mean to be a magnificent? What does it mean when I'm a dragon? And we all are, but we're taught be the light, be the light. You gotta be enlightened, Alex. You gotta be, you gotta be the light. Shut up. You gotta be both because the sun is equally as blinding in all of its lightness as the dark is equally as dark. So when you feel that people go, well, you gotta be light, I always check, crack up and go, so you ever heard the saying being blinded by the light? I'm like, so if you're so focused on being light, you forget that the other half of you exists, right? And the universe is light and dark made up cohesively. That's how you know there's light and dark. And so, so too are us, but our light and dark happens to be conformed in energetic emotion more often than not. And to explore that, give yourself the permission to do it, starting with the first question of, okay, contemplate my death, contemplate it. Contemplate one day you're not going to wake up. And did you experience everything you really, 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 really deep down in here that you're so scared that they might find out because you want to get tickled in the ear because that turns you on and makes you feel all a giddy that they find out that you're a freak. Guess what? Everybody's a freak. Calm down. What I'm using that as an example for is to go, why not? At least experience it. And then you can say, oh, 
you know, I was scared of that feather because, you know, I always thought feathers were variety in the constitution because that's what feathers are really for, blah, 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 or birds are fly. And you put them in these boxes, taking out of the box takes it experiential and wait for it, kids. Here we go. Full circle conclusion on such your curiosity stays intact, ignited. It ignites it. And your ignition is because the passion is sitting there going, here's the spark. There's your curiosity and your passion explodes because now you become passionate about everything. Clearly, we've been on this podcast now for a great bit of time, about an hour and about 90 minutes with my guest, give or take, if I feel. Okay, guess what? I'm still having a great conversation. I love the questions you're asking because you're the first podcast that's ever asked me these questions. I'm like, that's some cool shit. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for letting me explore that with you on this podcast. I'm grateful that I took the time to say yes to your invitation. Yes, sir. I'll gladly do your podcast. I don't care if one person's listening or four billion. Doesn't matter to me. I'm having a great conversation with a man who asked me some questions where I'm like, that's a really cool question, man. I'm curious about myself. Hold on. Let me go look at this and let me answer what I think is cool. That's a gift. And thank you for the gift to me, by the way. And so I think people to overcome those things using that language, it's about really acknowledging it. Get the curiosity, which ignites the passion. Passion creates the vision. The vision, the mission slash adventure will leave your legacy and you will leave no stone unturned. You will not miss anything that your life was designed to because you're back to what you know, I work with my kids on and how I live my life. I know my true compass north. I know this feels right because of my curiosity about things. Right. I'm curious about most things, but there's certain things I'm not curious about. For example, I have zero uh, curiosity about diving into the, you know, the torrential abyss of the Pacific Ocean and going, you know, two miles down in the ocean. I have zero curiosity about that. Not interested. Right. <laughs> but I'm but I'm curious as hell to take a boat across the ocean. That's interesting to me. So I use those as, as metaphoric examples. And there's things that you're not going to be curious about. But isn't that what makes you you? Because each one of us is on our own beautiful adventure and we're collectively in this big theme park called Earth and um, concurrently at the exact same time, the theme park of life. So go play, make the theme of your life fun, make business fun again, make the quest an adventure, be adventurous, stop falling asleep to the grind. And that's how those things will come up and you can you know, clear out your dungeon, do a little housekeeping and your castle will take on a whole new feel. Well, Travis, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thank you. Thanks for appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks for uh, thanks for all of you listening uh, to my story and fun. And I hope you guys come join the quest. And Alex, thank you for continuing to podcast. And thank you for being curious enough to go and create this. I really appreciate it.